Okay, this video is called so Sodium and Hypertension. What's the deal? And what I'm going to do here is explain why all the contradictions. In conventional medicine, you see them give these really wimpy guidelines, you know, try to keep your sodium beneath 3,000, 2,000 milligrams per day, whatever. And then you also hear a lot of internet sites and authors and books saying, you know, oh, sodium's not that important for hypertension. It's not that big of a deal. Um, you'll hear Dr. Kempner, though, in his writing say sodium is extremely important. And remember, you know, sodium, Kempner is one of the greatest doctors who ever lived. And here he is saying that sodium is extremely important as a cause of hypertension. And then it seems that Dr. McDougall contradicts him by saying, oh, no, it's not that important. You can drop your sodium from, you know, 5,000 down to 3,000 milligrams per day, and it's not going to make that much of a difference. And Kempner said, well, it does make a difference if you drop your sodium intake down to, you know, 500 milligrams a day or even better to 200 milligrams a day or in some patients as low as 100 milligrams per day. So the question is, why does Kempner say it's important and McDougall does not? Uh, I'm going to explain that. It'll be real straightforward. Why do the Japanese have so many strokes? Well, they were, you know, eating tons of sodium, like, you know, 12 to 14 grams per day, 12,000 to 14,000 milligrams per day, a ton of sodium. And they're also smoking cigarettes like chimneys, so they had a lot of hypertension, and that led to them having a lot of strokes. But why do the Japanese have so few heart attacks? Well, they ate a very low-fat diet, and they ate a lot of vegetables, and that counteracted uh, the development of coronary artery disease, okay, but they still had a lot of cerebrovascular disease. Hypertension especially causes intracranial atherosclerosis, and that's been called the Asian atherosclerosis versus coronary artery disease, especially the Western type of atherosclerosis with the high-fat diets, okay, and then hypertension being the intracranial type, high-fat diets being the cardiac type. Okay, why do the Japanese in Papua New Guinea have relatively few cancers? And it's thought because they did not eat a high-fat diet. The high-fat diet, you know, of course, cigarette smoking contributes to hypoxia, less oxygen going to the tissues, which is associated with injuring the mitochondria, the whole Warburg effect thing. But when you superimpose high-fat diet on it, it gets significantly worse. Okay, I'm going to show you a couple slides of high blood pressure to make sense of everything, and then I'll give you the explanation about what, what really matters. It's a question of ratio. It'll make sense in a moment. Okay, this is a real famous paper here. You might want to take a screenshot of this one. Blood pressure in the African native. It's bearing upon hypertension. Okay, uh, and this is in Kenya. Author C.P. Donison, paper written in 1929, Lancet Journal. And in Kenya, they found that 1,800 consecutive adult admissions to the hospital and not a single patient had high blood pressure. These are all uh, adults from Kenya, whereas if you took a bunch of adults in America, blacks, and you checked their blood pressure, probably about 80% of them will be hypertensive. Okay, so that's rather extraordinary to not have any of them hypertensive. Why? Because they ate a plant-based diet in Kenya, whereas in the USA, they tend to eat way too much processed food, which is real high in sodium and very low in potassium. Okay, uh, the plasma membrane of every cell has at least 25% of its energy devoted to the sodium potassium ATP pump. It's up to two-thirds of the energy in a neuron and brain cells. So what it does is it pulls in two positive charges in the form of potassium and it pumps out three sodiums. Okay. NA is the abbreviation for sodium, for natrium, it's the Latin word for sodium. K for potassium because kalium is the Latin word for um, potassium. And this pump is super important. The sodium potassium pump is basically an electrical generator. There's a net positive charge going out. That's the current. And you have charge separation across the plasma membrane. Okay. You also need magnesium anytime you have a reaction with ATP given off a of phosphate. We're going to talk about that in a moment. This establishes a gradient whereby there's more sodium outside than inside the cell. And that's called a chemical gradient. There's also an electrical gradient because there's a negative charge inside the cell because you're pumping out more positive charge, negative 65 millivolts. So you have an electrical chemical gradient. That gradient is harvested to pump calcium out. You have to pump calcium out because calcium is the activator of cells. So in order for a cell to turn itself off, you've got to be able to pump that calcium out. So the sodium wants to come in, they let the sodium come in, and then the calcium simultaneously is pumped out. So it's kind of like a water wheel, a water mill wheel um, to generate the energy. And it, it actually comes from the gradient established by this pump. 
This is all really, really important because most Americans eat far too much sodium and not enough potassium, and they dissipate this gradient. They start accumulating too much sodium inside the cell, and then these NACA exchangers don't work so well, and that messes up cell function. I'm going to show why. In order to maintain its osmolality and to prevent itself from swelling, water goes in the direction of the particles. So the more positive ions you have in a cell, sodium and potassium, the more water would go into the cell. If you just kept letting more potassium and sodium come into the cell, water would follow and the cell would bulge and burst. Okay, so you can't have that. The amount of potassium and sodium inside a cell is always a fixed amount. And if a person eats excessive dietary sodium, they're going to piss out, you know, through urine. They're going to void away more of their potassium. They're going to have higher bodily storage of sodium, and more of it's going to be intracellular, and those gradients are going to be dissipated in just about every cell in the entire body. So you need to know this. The gradient, the amount of sodium and potassium inside the cell is always constant. It has to be. And that's why you cannot win the game by eating high-salt diets. You're screwed, okay? You're, you're going to have a problem with every cell in your body. And yes, it's going to make more hypertension, but it's also going to cause dysfunction of everything happening in that plasma membrane that depends on that gradient, which is most things happening across that plasma membrane. Okay, hypertension is just a symptom of high fat diets and high uh, sodium. Okay, there's a, there's a few other things that contribute to it, but now here's why it's such a big deal to get the calcium out. Calcium is normally very low in its concentration in the cytoplasm of a cell. Typically, it's about 10,000 to 15,000 times higher concentration in the extracellular space than inside the cytoplasm. When calcium concentration in the cell rises, it activates the cell. Like if it's a vascular smooth muscle cell, that will make the cell contract. Whatever that cell does, high cytoplasm calcium makes it do that main thing. Like for a neuron, it'll be to send an action potential, okay, to release its neurotransmitter. Okay. And that gradient is coupled to all kinds of other things, pumping protons, uh, pumping amino acids, etc. Okay, so the ratio of dietary potassium to sodium is called the K factor. And the guy who popularized this was Richard Moore in his book, High Blood Pressure Solution. He devoted his whole life, real smart MD, PhD guy, he devoted his whole life to, to studying plasma membrane, uh, sodium potassium pumps, and their relationship to hypertension. This is, a, this is a very important thing to know. You want a minimum K factor of over five, minimum. I think our ancestors probably had K factors more in the range of about 20. Okay, how do cells work? Like, how does blood pressure work? You've got these endothelial cells which are orientated with their long axis parallel to the direction of blood flow. And then perpendicular is going like this. That is the, the long axis of your vascular smooth muscle. Okay, so your vascular smooth, smooth mu muscle circumferentially encircles the artery. That's important to know. The endothelial cell, which is the lining cells of the artery, they make nitric oxide. It's a gas. It diffuses into the arterial lumen, the center of the blood vessel, and it causes the platelets to not clot. It prevents them from clotting. That's good. It's a gas. It diffuses into the wall. The artery goes to the vascular smooth muscle cells that circumferentially, you know, they're perpendicular to the endothelial cells. And when it's in there, it gets them to relax. And so it prevents them from squeezing down the diameter. So it makes the blood vessels bigger in diameter. That's called vasodilation. Okay, the magnesium with its 2 plus positive charge is used to hold the second and third phosphate onto the ATP. ATP is like the energy currency of a cell. Phosphates have a very big negative charge. So you need something to control it before it's going to be released as part of the reaction. So magnesium does that. Magnesium is the mellow out ion. Magnesium is located in nature in the center of chlorophyll. So when you eat the plant, you get the magnesium. Okay, I just wanted to show you the K, reactor, the K factor on some foods because it helps show you why you know it's good to eat um, fruits and starches. Fruits have the highest K factors in general. They got these incredible K factors you know, 250, 400, one, over 100, super high. And remember, you just got to keep it above 5. I, I actually think you really should try to keep it at least above 10. But, you know, according to Richard Moore, he said a minimum of 5 to have a good blood pressure. But, you know, to have an ideal blood pressure, it would be nice to keep it above 10. 
Okay, the only person who has to watch out about their potassium would be somebody who, let's say, has advanced kidney failure. Okay, so if you've got advanced kidney failure, then you can't eat so much potassium. All right, starches tend to be in the middle with K factors, let's say in the ballpark of 50 to 160. Um, potatoes have a K factor of 40. Uh, black beans have a K factor of only 19. I think I got lentils on or somewhere. Lentils had a K factor of about 50. So the high K factor is good. You want it to be high. Salads are a little uh, weaker in their K factors. You know, you're talking about single or double digits, 5 to 15. Okay, but now here's where it gets a little more interesting. When you go into processed foods, they barely, they have terrible K factors because they add sodium as preservatives and for taste. And look at special K cereal, supposedly a healthy breakfast cereal. It's got a K factor of 0 0.06, less than 0.1. The average American tends to run a K factor of about 0.4 or 0.5, which is terrible. You really want it a minimum of 5, so it's far, far, far too low. And this is why there's so much hypertension. And when you have hypertension, it means that every cell in your body, if you've got this sodium-potassium issue, is not functioning at its optimal. Things like Cheerios, K-factor of 1.2, pretty bad. Okay, because remember, you want a minimum of 5. These are terrible numbers. Cheeto, 0.14, they're terrible numbers. And you see the pattern. Again, the best K-factor ratios are fruits, then starches, then veggies, and then animal foods are really sort of barely getting by, and processed foods are terrible. Okay, this was just one article showing uh, estimated amounts of sodium potassium intake. And it basically said Westerners, Americans, tend to eat about 4,000 milligrams a day of sodium. I think that's an underestimation. And they eat about uh, half that amount, 2,000 milligrams a day of um, potassium. And really, it should be the other way around. They should be eating, like we said, a minimum K factor of about 5 minimum, I would say 10 or more, because... Um, that's what you need to be healthy. That's what we're designed to eat. So anyways, oh, t just to make sense of it all. So the reason why McDougall would say most of the time it doesn't make that big of a deal is because if you cut dietary sodium, let's say from 4,000 milligrams a day to 2,000 milligrams a day, you're not going to change your K-factor very much, okay? Let's say your sodium intake, your potassium intake was the same, 2,000 milligrams a day. So when you, when you cut the K-factor from being, you know, 0.5 down to being 1, 1 to 1, that's not that big of a deal. But if you get the sodium, let's say you started out at, um, you get your, you get your sodium down to 500, and previously it was, let's say, 4,000, and your potassium remains the same at 2,000. Well, now that's a much bigger difference. Your K-factor is minimum 4, but you start eating plants, it's going to be higher than that because the plants are going to have a lot more potassium, so your K-factor is going to go much higher. So the point was, the smaller you squeeze down your sodium, the bigger a K-factor difference you're going to get because it's easier to get multiples of, let's say, 200 milligrams a day of so uh, sodium than it is to get multiples of 2,000 milligrams a day in sodium relative to the potassium amount. Does that make sense? The lower you go, the bigger the exponential, so to speak, the, the bigger the order of magnitude, the returns you get in terms of generating a K-factor ratio versus the higher the numbers you start out with, the less difference, you know, a change of 1,000 makes because it's not going to affect your K-factor ratio too much. Here's just a Yanomami in the Amazon jungle in South America. You know, they'd have average adult blood pressure is 95 over 61. They don't add any salt to their food. They don't have any hypertension or obesity. Their blood, level, their blood pressures don't elevate with age. Okay, so anyways, that's the explanation that it's the ratio that matters. And Kempner was more about, McDougall was more about getting, you know, middle-aged and older people to be reasonably healthy. Kempner was more about people who are end of the line, you know, about to die and turning their health around. So he had to be much more stricter. You know, he's been described as being the plant world intensive care unit is, is Walter Kempner's inpatients. So... That's how it makes sense, that it's the ratio. And P for plant, P for potassium. There's tons of potassium in plants, so you just eat the plants. You get what you need. You avoid the animal foods. You avoid all the fat. And they're often salted, and all the processed foods, they got tons of salt, often a lot of fat, very little potassium. So that's how it works, and that's how they can easily be reconciled, uh, Kempner and McDougall. I hope that was helpful.